I will be preaching from our second lesson, that is Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17. But first, I think we need a little bit of explanation about today. Way back in 1517, there was an irascible little monk with a fondness for beer and who was known for being a little grumpy named Martin Luther. And way back in 1517, Martin Luther decided to get into his head that he really didn't like a practice the church was doing, namely the selling of indulgences, and decided to question that practice. And so he nailed something to the front door of the church. This would be hard at our church because our doors are glass. But Martin Luther had wooden doors, so they were more prepared for it. This kicked off a series of events that we call the Reformation, and we celebrate every Reformation Day as Lutherans. And it's an important day to celebrate, because it celebrates us standing up for what we believe. But there's another date on the calendar we rarely celebrate, and Worship Committee and I thought it might be worth celebrating, which is today, which is a big, it's a big phrase, so hold on, don't fall asleep in the middle of it but it's called the Presentation of the Augsburg Confession. No, I'm not going to make you repeat that. I know what you're asking, Pastor, what's the Augsburg Confession? Well, after Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door and after he started his reform movement and started challenging the theology of the church in many and various ways, and after people started following Luther in his reforms, This caused quite a deal of conflict. So much so that eventually the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire declared that the Lutheran party within the empire was commanded to present a confession of everything they believed before the empire and before the emperor and before the imperial legislature. The empire and the imperial government met at a city named Augsburg that year that they were ordered to present. And so the document the Lutherans presented was called the Augsburg Confession. It's a list of many articles. It's not just like the Apostles' Creed. It's it's a book, folks. And it's everything that we believe. It defines what Lutheranism is. To this day, when I was ordained and when Keith gets ordained, there is a promise that we make that before God to whom we must one day give account, we promise to teach, preach, and confess the Augsburg Confession. So it's important for us because it defines Lutheranism, and this is the day where we were asked to define what Lutheranism is. And so I think today is worth celebrating. So that brings us to the question, what is Lutheranism? No, this isn't catechism class, don't worry. To answer that question, we got to look at Romans, but to first answer that question, I got to ask you something. Have you ever lost something that you've like literally been holding in your hand? Right? Like the other day, I put my glasses like this, and I must have spent five minutes looking for them. Like, it was embarrassing, right? Thank God it was my day off and I was the only one home, and it was just the dogs looking at me like I was crazy. But we all have that experience, right, where we desperately are searching for something and we can't find it even though it's right next to us. And in fact, the whole idea of searching for something is kind of one of the basic storylines of most, right, most movies and stories in our life. Think of how many times the hero has to go searching for something. So Indiana Jones has to go searching for the Holy Grail. Luke Skywalker has to go looking for Yoda, right? Think of how many times the basic story is going searching for something. Whether you're searching for something you're holding right in your hands or you're going on a big long quest to find the wise man at the top of the mountain, searching for something is fundamental to what we humans think we do. And in our effort to search for something, right, what we often do is we work so very hard at it, right? So again, right, the hero has to face all kind of trials 
and all kind of work on their way to searching for something, right? To become a Jedi, Luke Skywalker has to run through that wet jungle. It sounds awful to me. I don't like running in normal life, much less in a jungle. The hero has to do all this work and has to expend all this energy, and if he tries hard enough, and if he's faithful enough, and if he's strong enough, and if he's successful enough, then he will find what he's looking for. Or even if it's like me, and you're searching for something that is right next to you, right? My mom would always tell me, just open your eyes. And I'd look at her, and I'd say, my eyes are open. If I could see it, I wouldn't be searching for it. That response never went over well. But no matter what, searching for something is always about our effort. It's always about what we do. We then turn this attitude often to God. And so people on the street will ask you, have you found God yet? And we make God or spiritual enlightenment out to something that you have to expend all this effort in searching for, right? You've got to go find the wise guru at the top of the mountain. You've got to do all these things, do all these practices in order to be holy enough. You have to do, you have to do, you have to do. Of course, the trick with that, what I have learned, is that it doesn't really work very well, right? I actually have learned that the quickest way for me to find something is for me to stop looking for it, right? I could turn the whole house upside down and, and, and not find it, but the minute I put it out of my mind and stop searching for it, it'll suddenly appear right in front of my eyes. Trick is, is that all our efforts for searching don't really work very well, and that brings us to Romans where St. Paul is writing about Jesus Christ. And St. Paul, I don't know if you know this, but St. Paul is a good Lutheran. Come on, guys. <laughs> that was a joke. It was a Lutheran joke. St. Paul says in verse 6 and 7 and 8, he says this, But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is, who will bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near to you, on your lips and in your heart. The good news of Jesus Christ, the good news that Martin Luther was so focused on, the good news that the Augsburg Confession states over and over again, and the good news that we cling to as Lutherans and as Christians is this, the word is very near to you. You don't have to ascend up to the height of the mountain to go find God. In fact, God finds you. And you don't need to go down into the deepest valley into hell itself in order to find God. In fact, God finds you. The word is very near to you. It is close, so desperately close that it reaches out and touches you and grabs you. In Lutheranism, we fundamentally believe that God always comes to you. That you need not be searching. You need not expend all that effort. You need not go on a quest to find God. For God is very near to you. He is near to you in your hospital rooms when everything seems to be going wrong. He is near to you in the various crises of your life, whether that's crises of family or of bills or whatever that is. He is near to you. He is near to you when you mess up and you don't have to go on some quest to get better in order to find God. God is near to you. The Word is near to you. It is good news. We have no greater proof of that good news than Griffin today. Thank you, Griffin, for being my sermon illustration. He doesn't know it, but he's a great sermon illustration. In the waters of his baptism, Griffin will be claimed by the loving God and will be forgiven and washed, and guess what? None of this is his doing. Griffin didn't have to go on a quest to find those waters. He likes to play with them, the baptismal font, but, you know, don't we all? 
He didn't have to qualify. He didn't have to pass a test. He didn't have to prove he was good enough or holy enough. All he had to do was be brought here because the word comes to him. That's right. (laughs) The word comes to him. Jesus comes to him. We believe this about Jesus Christ for all of us, that Jesus Christ in all of your baptisms has come to you. It's not something you've done to qualify for or that you've searched after and found. In fact, Jesus Christ has come to you. So my prayer for you is that you all cling to this good news, for it is good news. In a world that makes us earn everything and makes us go searching for everything, God says, I am different than the world you know. I love differently than the world you know, for I love you and I come to you and I meet you all in the waters of your baptism. And that is most certainly good news indeed. Amen.